Adrian, let's hear about the sun. Right, so I know we talk about Masada literally all the time, and I know that Caleb, or whatever his name is, I don't remember his name, also did a presentation that was about Masada, but uh, hopefully I can keep you interested with a different angle. So, uh, Masada, first and foremost, where, it's actually important where Masada is located. It's near the southernmost end of the Dead Sea, and built in view of all the other Herodian fortress, well, Herodian fortresses, and I know I used that map before, but that map over there shows how all of the forts in that area can are visible from each other, and thus, when one, if one sees a threat, the rest can light up beacons so that the entire uh, complex is alerted. And that's actually pretty significant because Masada is farthest to the south, so any uh, threats that come up from Arabia would be spotted from there. Uh, it is said to have built by the by King Alexander Janias in the first century BC, but then expanded by Herod the Great from from uh, 37 to 31 BC. Uh, there's actually two palaces. There's a western palace and a northern palace. The northern palace is really like right there, and then the Western Palace is to the left of that. The uh, Western Palace is what actually contains the throne room, but the Northern Palace ha continues two levels down over the cliff, like that. Pretty interesting design choice. And uh, <clears throat> it also had a casemate wall that went around the entire mesa, essentially. But uh, it was it became most important during the first Jewish-Roman War that lasted from 66 to 73 is when the Jews finally rebelled outright against Roman authority and attempted to establish an independent provisional Judean government. It was supported by a bunch of radical factions, uh, most notably the Zealots and the Edomites, but for the purpose of Masada, the most important were a, a particular group called the Sakari. And uh, interesting fact about them, they were the original assassins. They, they hid knives in their cloaks and then would just jump out of a crowd and kill a Roman official and then jump back in the crowd. And the Spanish word Sicario, is di which means hitman, is directly taken from their name. If anyone's seen the movie Sicario. The, anyway, during the First Jewish Roman War, the Roman army completely destroyed the Second Temple of Jerusalem. The, mass, the massive temple at Herod started that took decades to build. They just tore it down within hours, left nothing standing, just like Jesus predicted. And uh, after that, the 10th Fratensis Legion stayed in Judea to capture the Herodian forts that were still being used by uh, Jewish rebels who were still trying to hold out. So, re really, Masada itself wasn't that important to the Romans, but the Sicarii, well, especially since the Sicarii numbered left less than a thousand, and that was including women and children, but they started raiding villages around Masada and slaughtering civilians just to gather uh, supplies to stay alive. So the, Ro so the remaining Roman legion decided that enough was enough, and they had to put down these rebels before they kill anyone else. The, but the Sicarii were led by a radical named Eleazar ben Yair, who, uh, we'll get into him later, while the, the legion was led by Lucius Flavius Silva. He had about 8,000 and 9,000 legionaries and auxiliaries who were recruited from the local population. Said that he also used slaves for attacking. Uh, the Romans had a very efficient way of sieging Masada, and all of their work still remains, mostly. They built seven camps that completely encircle Masada and built a wall around it. I just want to put that out. They literally built a wall around Masada just to, just to keep the Sakari from escaping. And all of these camps, they, they look like that, were all placed in different areas and all connected by that wall. That way there'd be no weak points from where the, the Sakari could break out. 
And they also constructed an artificial ramp up into up to the wall of Masada itself because before that uh, there was only one small path that zigzagged and was very difficult to come up that obviously could not be used to breach the fort. So the Roman engineers just built that ramp artificially so where they could push their siege engines up into it. Uh, so mo really everything we know about this war and about the siege of Masada comes from our old pal Joe, who uh, <clears throat> claimed that Eleazar encouraged the entire camp to commit mass suicide as soon as the Romans broke through, because the Romans pretty much broke through the defensive wall in one day. And after they broke one wall, they left another in flames and just one attack. And so... The Sakari's last stand in Masada has since become a legend of Jewish resistance against a pagan onslaught, but the Sakari did not actually support the independent Jewish government. So they, they were their own extremist faction, so that's kind of weird, but it, even still, Masada is essentially the Jewish version of the Alamo. But anyway. Masada was never really excavated until about 1963, until uh, the former chief of staff of the Israeli Defense Forces, Yigal Yadin, uh, led it. Oh my God! Man. Remember that? Until he led a team to fully excavate the entire place. They managed to restore a lot of structures, such as wall paintings, the bathhouses, the synagogue, the storehouses, and the barracks that were used by the Sakari. They also found many fragments of texts of Genesis, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Psalms, and Ezekiel. And they also, interestingly, found human remains. About 28 skeletal remains were discovered, 27 men and one woman, and their ethnicity is unknown. Most of them are believed to have been Jewish. However, the remains of two men and one woman were found at a bathhouse, and they are believed to have been Roman prisoners, possibly. Why, why they would keep, why the Sakari would keep prisoners in a bathhouse, I'm not sure, but that was, maybe that would have been the only place they had. But, so, as I mentioned before, Josephus is our only written source for all these events that occurred in Judea during this time period. But, uh... Archaeology seems to dispute a lot of things that good old Joe wrote. For example, Josephus claimed that it was the Hasmonean king Alexander Janias who actually built Masada, but when, uh, when Yadin's team excavated the place, they could find no ver uh, verifiable remains of Hasmonean architecture. The only evidence they found of Hasmoneans ever being there were the many coins of Alexander Janias, but that could have easily just been uh, wealth that the Sakari brought with them. And he also, it is also said that uh, there, there are remains of two palaces. We, we know for a fact there were two palaces in Masada because one is that there, there's, their ruins are somewhat still intact, but Josephus wrote of only one. Maybe he just didn't know about the other one. <laughs> But I don't see how he could not know because it is said that he got all of his information from the Roman officers who were there. And surely the Roman officers would not have missed an entire palace since they breached the fortress and wiped out the Sakari. But for some reason, he only talks about one palace. And he also gives exaggerated descriptions of the heights of walls and the towers. And finally, the, the legend of mass suicide. There is no evidence that the, that the Sakari committed mass suicide, and there are no examples of Jewish heroes ever committing suicide. The only time a Jewish hero ever killed himself was Samson, and that was he was already dead, and he was bringing the enemy down with him. So there, it wouldn't really make sense why this... But it, it doesn't make sense why Eleazar would just order all his followers, including the women and children, to just kill themselves. Maybe they were that fanatical, but if they really were, we have no evidence that they did. And those are my sources. Okay. Any questions? Well, certainly Josephus mentions other people committing suicides at other sites, similar kind of sites. I don't remember where the source was, but I read something that said it was possibly... 
he he was possibly suffering stress from and his own attempted suicide, and thus tended to write about other people killing themselves. I find that to be odd, but who knows? Well, all right, thank you. Yeah, Josephus uh, was a commander at another fortress and did order people to commit suicide there. And when it got to him, he said, no thanks. All right, so I did the island of Crete in the Mediterranean. So, a quick uh, summary of Crete for like where it is on the circles over there in the Mediterranean near Asia Minor, and it's a uh, part of Greece. So, changing hands, uh, it's been part of the Romans, and then Byzantine when it split, and then Arab rule, Byzantine again, Venetian rule, Ottoman Empire, the Allied powers, World War One, and then Greece to present day. And the Allied powers were Great Britain, France, Italy, and Russia that had troops in there, and their admirals uh, governed the island together. Okay. So for myths and legends, um, the first queen of, queen of Crete, according to Greek mythology, was the Queen Europa, which is where the name Europe derives from. Um, one of her three sons, Minos, is said to have founded uh, Gnosis and gave him his name to the Minoan civilization. Gnosis is the biggest um, city and had the biggest palace on Crete. And later, Minos became king, and when he refused to sacrifice a bull to the gods, his wife was seduced by a bull and later gave birth to the legendary Minotaur. And uh, Theseus, or Theseus, the son of the king of Athens, killed the Minotaur and escaped the famous labyrinth. And this is a picture of what they think maybe like what caused the stories of the labyrinth was this underground cave system that they found so that could have been like where the stories came from for the labyrinth and uh, the minotaur <laughs> could be um in ancient crete uh, and it said the island crete is where the minoan civilization started and it thrived roughly around 2600 to 1150 bc and the Minoans were able to build a strong naval empire in the Mediterranean and famous um, luxurious palaces. And so uh, there's a palace of Knossos, like part of it on the top right there. And it had those um, three pillars that you see that are still there. Those are like famous pillars that are around multiple palaces on Crete. It's that kind of style. And on the bottom right is an artist re rendition of... Uh, what it would look like, or what they believe it would look like if it were fully restored. And uh, there's no confirmed answer to what happened to the Minoans, but it's widely believed that it was that they were destroyed by natural disasters, including the eruption of the volcano of Santorini, Santorini, Santorini. yeah, and invaded by Arcanians and Durians tribes from North Northern Europe. And after these events, the Minoan civilization collapsed and never rose again. So that's what they believe took them out, but they don't 100% mm -hmm. know for sure. Yeah, the big waves of volcanic ash spreading. Um, and then there's something I found is the Roman occupation came in 69 AC and lasted until 330 AC, followed by the Byzantine era, which... The wealth of Crete is still visible in the beautiful mosaic floor of the basilicas that were built during these times. So these are two pictures of some mosaics that are like pretty That's kept. That's interesting. You have AC. So I mean, usually you'd have AD oh. or, or yeah. you'd have, so that you'd have CD. That would be AD. You'd like put them together. Yes. <laughs> After common. Yes. And then, you know, the other part of that uh, is DC. And it's a band. Okay, go ahead. DC, DC, DC. Okay, so uh, the um, mosaics on the right there, though, those are still ones that are kept pretty uh, largely intact. And the one on the bottom, actually, they both do. But the one on the bottom shows like the man riding riding the whales, and they have a lot of sea-oriented mosaics since they were like a naval power and island of Crete in the Mediterranean. So 
there's a lot of those, but on the, on the bottom of it, you can see like the waves, and there's a lot of different ones that are just waves, and so those are pretty nice. So there's um, Gnosis, if I'm saying that right, and it was the capital of the Minoan Crete, and it was also the largest palace of Crete. Arthur Evans was the British archaeology who excavated the site in 1900 AD. Uh, he also restored large parts of the palace in a way that is possible today to appreciate the grandeur and complexity of a structure that evolved over several millennia and grew to occupy about 20,000 square meters. So on the top there you see those pillars again, same type of pillars, and those were the, those are going into the, um, I guess main chambers or like where yeah, near, the king near the would palace. sit. Yeah. And on the bottom, there's an aerial view of yeah, the site, so you can see how, I mean, he's how. somewhat controversial. This quote that you have is very uh, nice to him, but some people aren't as nice to him. They say that, well, you know, he restored this and he did too much. But, you know, for example, those pillars up there, he restored them. So uh, we have a good idea what they look like, or at least what Sir Arthur Evans thinks they look like. But... Uh, of course, he left lots of them he didn't restore. So, anyway, it's you know it's it's always a a balance, right? An archaeological site, people look at that kind of stuff in your bottom picture. To me, yeah, that's very interesting. But to other people, it's maybe not. But what's on top is a lot more interesting. Part of that was there. A lot of it's restored. But it does give you, I would I would agree, uh, a sense of the grandeur and complexity of this. The site. Yeah. Right. So yeah, I did see that people didn't like all of his because it's obviously his interpretation. Yeah. So. And of course, see now it's been there more than a hundred years. You know, his his restoration is now like 120, roughly, mm -hmm. over 100 years old. So it begins to look old. So a lot of people, when they come to visit the site, they don't know that that is. A reconstruction. They think that's really what it is. Okay, go ahead. Um, so then, oh, uh, I'll point out is on the bottom picture there, you can see like those trees are like full grown trees. You can see how big this actually was compared to like if you had a little human down there. So it was a pretty humongous uh, palace. Next place is uh, Phaistos. I think. Uh, it's the second largest palace on Crete, mm -hmm. and it was built in a strategic place, able to see all the Masara plain below. So you can see on the top picture, you can see all the, I think it's, they said southwest, so behind it, like that was the whole plain, so you don't have, you can see everything from, uh, from that distance, um, or that height, and uh, it was compared to Gnosis, the architecture of Phaistos was more simplified and also it was built in an orderly arrangement that refers to a single architect. So they think that one single architect like originally did it and then over the years it was added on to because it took um, quite a long time to finish it. Um, and the main courtyard still remains its original pavement and stone. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Like, it wasn't repurposed like a lot of things are in the ancient world. Um, so that was Phaistos. And then Malia, uh, it's the third largest palace on Crete, and it was first built around 1900 BC, and it covers about 7,500 square meters. And the palace of Malia was discovered in 1915 by Joseph Hadziticus, a Greek archeologist. It was fully excavated from 1922 onwards by the French school at Athens in collaboration with Greek scholars. So in this top photo is the grand uh, staircase and it would have led up to the main hall where they did like there was a lot of religious uh, ceremonies and from there it would lead to the royal chamber of whoever res resided there. So the grand staircase is still intact from, from original so that, that's pretty neat and on the bottom there you can see six big pillars so they're called the pillar crypts and these would have uh these are next to the 
uh, main, the grand uh, staircase, and they would have made it up. That would have been like an area, like a, I guess, like a common area to like socialize and stuff, but like going to the staircase to where like the religious stuff is. So those, the, if those pillars were st like still original, it would have, they were really high. So it's like, I didn't have a picture of like a artist rendition of it, but it would have been like really, really big. Um, and then that, that's it. Question. Yeah, Crete is, a, is an amazing place to visit. If you get a chance, I would recommend it. Okay. Let's hear from Tyler. Right, I did mine on Egyptian archaeology. Um, the website I chose was about Egyptology and archaeology, which I thought was interesting because you can see you know, two different aspects, not just archaeology. Um, the history initially goes back to 3000 BC, and um, the definition of actual Egyptology is the study of history in regards to, like the language, religion, art, literature, and architecture. So I actually found this to be kind of like archaeology because you know you're finding different things, and archaeology is basically discovering artifacts. So I feel like discovering art and like their writing forms and all that stuff was part of archaeology, so I thought it'd be interesting to intertwine the two. And anyone can be an uh, Egyptologist if you practice or study, so like even stuff like what we did at that place where you're, you know, discovering artifacts, even though it's technically archaeology, it could also be um, Egyptology, well, if you were in Egypt doing that. Um, the history of Egypt starts all the way back in 53, um, the 5300 BC. Um, with the pre-dynastic period, which is also the Neolithic period. And over the ages, it just went through so many different transitions from dynasties to eras and um, just constantly getting taken over by different conquerors and rulers and falls and empires. Um, but modern Egypt history actually began when Napoleon Bonaparte actually conquered Egypt around 1800. So the ancient Egyptian gods are one of the most influential people in Egypt at that time and there was numerous gods and not just one and they played an important role in the lives of ancient Egyptians and there was many rituals that took place that people found and discovered through the actual writings on the walls that they excavated um, in a lot of the pyramids and they showed the stuff that they would um, do and how it was one of like the biggest centers of life at that time and there were festivals as well to worship the gods. So probably the most, the biggest thing in Egypt or ancient Egypt was the pyramids and, you know, they're the most complex mysteries of the world. Um, and a myth that people found out after um, uncovering a lot of it, that the workers are actually um, Egyptians and not slaves. And that was a common misconception. Um, there are chambers inside these tombs that archaeologists discovered over the years and found just vast amounts of treasures and artifacts and most of it hasn't even been discovered yet. Some of them are so, there's so many different passages and stuff in these pyramids and it's very complex. Uh, Khufu is the Great Pyramid, the one you see in the middle, the huge one, and that was built around 2506 BC and this is the, uh, the most famous of the pyramids. Hieroglyphs, these were discovered as well um, when they excavated parts of ancient Egypt. And a hieroglyph basically is the writing system that they use, and they were like symbols. And they use basically pictures to describe the words. Um, and archaeologists and scholars found three different forms of the hieroglyphs. There were the phonographs, which are just sounds, like phone, like it's a sound, a specific sound. Um, ideograms, which represent ideas instead of sounds. And then detrimentives, um, which are hieroglyphs that were not that cannot be spoken or translated. Uh, the mummies, that's another thing. If you go in museums, you'll see um, that were excavated. And the Egyptians believe that preserving the body was crucial to the person's soul. Um, so they feel like if you preserve the soul um, in one of these nice um, mummification processes, and your soul is protected in the afterlife and you'll live um, a great life.
And Howard Carter is the actual archaeologist that discovered King Tut's tomb. So he's probably one of the most famous archaeologists when it comes to ancient Egypt. And then since that discovery, they found thousands of others. And even um, which I found really interesting is that they mummified animals as well, which I didn't expect. But they found thousands and thousands of animal ones as well, which is very interesting. So the archaeological digs, as well as the paintings and drawings on the tombs of the walls, showed life was not really as different as people thought. They did a lot of the same things we did, such as farming and um, building. Like a lot of it was very similar. Their lifestyle wasn't just, I know it looks weird the way they drew it, but the lifestyle actually was very similar. Um, their main form of traveling around that time was by boat. And the food sources that they used, or ate was a uh, fish and the houses are built around the courtyards and all the cooking was done outside as they found in like the courtyard areas um the religion um so like i said there was many gods as polytheistic and individuals got to choose their own god and support that so there was some sort of freedom of religion and gods are often represented by like animal shaped people and um, the local village gods were worshipped at shrines and in people's houses. So usually just they would take place in courtyards, they would uh, worship and pray there. Um, but when it came to the temples, like those nice temples that you've seen, um, only the pharaoh, queen, priest, and priestess were allowed inside those. Like the common people were not allowed to go in there and worship, only the higher-ups. Uh, the Nile is what allowed Egypt to thrive for many years and it was because of its it was able to transport goods and materials and it was also fertile so that they could um, you know plant crops and soil on there and these are my sources thank you All right. thank you yeah, I was talking to uh, somebody uh, the other day I said uh, she said she was a pescatarian, and I said, well, are you a united pescatarian? And she said, no, just a regular one. I said, well, how do you celebrate Easter? She said, well, we eat fish. So, so that, you know, I would think a, a pasta pescatarian would be uh, somebody who went to church where they only served pasta. Believe it or not, there is an actual religion called the Church of Flying Spaghetti Monster. <laughs> Don't give it a little wafer. A spaghetti noodle and, a little wafer. and some fish oil for their special event. Well, anyway. As long as it's not fish sauce. Yeah, you got to watch those United Pescatarians because they're more liberal than the, uh, the Reformed Pescatarians. United Pescatarians, you know, they're the most liberal of all the Pescatarians. Matter of fact, they'll even eat sardines. <laughs>